Well, good morning, friends, and happy Sunday fun day. That's right, I'm back. My name is Pastor Kyle, and I don't usually have the opportunity, the honor to share with you two weeks in a row, um, but man, it's a privilege to pick up where we left off last week. Uh, Pastor Matt is wrapping up his summer study break uh, where he takes two weeks of vacation. He's not actually a robot. I know he's got a lot of enthusiasm and excitement, but he does need some rest. And so he is with his family uh, enjoying two weeks of vacation. He also takes two weeks to plan and prepare and to look ahead into what's next. Um, we don't just wing it around here and hope that things work out. Uh, we, we pursue the will and wisdom of God, and then we work as a team together uh, to, to be a part of what God is doing uh, in this generation. And so uh, as Matt wraps up his time uh, in summer study break, we want to pray for him as he rests and restores and comes back fired up next week, ready to go. Uh, now, he will be back this week. Friday night um, for our very first in-person gathering on the property. And man, we are so excited uh, to get together in three-dimensional actual reality, like live and in-person, not on our screens. And so we wanna make sure that you're there, that, that you know you're invited Friday night at 7 p.m. on the church property. It's on St. Andrew's Church Road, right across from where Fairgrounds Road intersects. And uh, it's gonna be a great time of, of worship and prayer and celebration. And we're gonna do this uh, as, as safely as possible. So we're gonna ask you to bring uh, your own chairs, your own bottle of water. We're gonna stay, st stay socially distanced uh, and outdoors. And so um, based on the CDC recommendations, you don't have to wear a mask, uh, but we hope to see you there. We realize that folks are at different levels uh, of readiness to gather back together again. And so um, we're gonna be mindful of that, that, that as you gather or as we um, mix and mingle together, uh, that if someone doesn't get up from their chair, they're probably not ready for you to come into their space. So be, uh, be aware, be socially aware. Um, if you're unsure, ask before you approach somebody and um, just be realizing that, that we're all in different places. Uh, if you're not ready to gather with the Gen Pop yet, that's okay. Uh, we're gonna record this and upload it as soon as we're able. We probably won't be able to live stream it, uh, but you know our tech team is amazing, so, so uh, you never know. Uh, lastly, as we're talking about the property, we want to celebrate uh, that this week, the team from the Great Mills Trading Post uh, has gotten out there with their big machines and they are moving some dirt and we are under construction. And so, uh, man, we are excited about that. Be praying for our local contractors as they work in the summer heat uh, to raise up what we believe is going to be a great resource uh, for our community to launch Jesus-led life change into Southern Maryland. And so I want to say thank you so much uh, for those of you who have continued to give and, and to partner financially with the Launching a Legacy campaign, even in these, whatever your the term is, uncertain, unprecedented, unnormal times. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for being a part of that. And it's so exciting uh, to see things moving. So I think we've uh, taken care of all the housekeeping. Let's jump in. Uh, now let me catch you up on the last few weeks if you've missed it. We are in a series called Homemade. Uh, and uh, we call it that because whether you had a perfect childhood or maybe your origin story is full of hurt and pain, uh, but regardless of where you came from, we are all the DIY projects uh, of our parents, our guardians, whoever raised us. Uh, and so uh, for the most part, not everybody, but for the most part, our parents did the best they could with what they had and what they knew at the time. And we discover as we get into our own parenting journey um, that just like us, they didn't exactly know what they were doing either. And so uh, uh, our homemade background uh, helps us determine our values as parents, our anti-values, those things that we say, well, I'll never do this or I'll never do that like my parents did. Um, we're shaped by our homemade experience. Uh, secondly, we, we chose this word homemade because uh, homemade has this understanding that homemade things that have quirks and flaws and imperfections and limitations. And those things are actually expected. Uh, that perfection isn't God's expectation for us. That he doesn't give us a lot of examples of perfect families in the scriptures or even consistently good families. Back in week one, Pastor Jen introduced us uh, to the not enough monster, that invisible force of our enemy um, that just wants to push guilt and shame. And Jen said that Jesus offers us a different way. And, and then last week, uh, you and I, we talked about uh, the idea of, of bringing both law and grace together 
um, to create wholeness in our kids, that we can't just react out of fear and insecurity. We can't just react to everything with law and order. And on the other side, we can't just be our, our kid's best friend um, who, who just accepts them and gives grace uh, all the time without developing the internal character that they need for success. And, and so uh, last reminder before I jump into this week is that this series is for everyone, whether you're a parent or not. Um, if you're pre-kids or post-kids or never kids, that's okay. These principles, they're transferable uh, to us personally for our personal development, uh, in our marriages, in our friendships, in our relationships with maybe our adult kids or our grandkids, nieces and nephews. Um, again, it's all transferable. Today, I, I want to continue with this theme that it's what's on the inside that counts, uh, that our goal as parents is not just to modify our kids' behavior, um, but to fight for their hearts. That, that at the end of the message, I'm going to point you to some resources that are going to help equip you um, practically of how to do this. But, but in reality, today is not going to be three easy strategies to parent or, or 10 tips to a better kid uh, because raising humans is harder than that. It's more complex than that. Uh, and the stakes are too high for that. And so today, uh, I want us to, to uh, revisit that, that we talked about fear-driven parenting last week, that when we operate out of fear and insecurity, uh, it changes the way that we understand our identity as parents. It changes our, our measurement of success. Um, it, it makes us worry about our reputation towards others. But fear is a liar, uh, and, and it robs us of the depth of relationship, and it creates a transactional relationship with our kids, where then both us as the parents and our kids are left feeling disconnected misunderstood, uh, and really unloved. And so no shame from me, I made my confession last week that I am not a perfect parent. And to be clear, all of us can fall into this trap. Uh, this is normal. You're not a bad parent if you want to, to help your kid be happy and successful and compliant. Uh, but the problem is that when we, when we have this quest to get our kids the best life we possibly can, uh, it leads to a deadly assumption. It leads to, to an assumption uh, that when it collides with the reality of the life that we live, when, when our assumption collides with the reality of the world we live in, it leads to death, death of relationships, death of our faith, uh, death of our God-given hopes and dreams. And sometimes this dysfunction, uh, this physical, emotional, spiritual dysfunction can lead to physical, actual death. And the assumption is this, I am in control, that, that I'm the captain of my ship, my destiny, uh, my crew, that I am in control of the success and the failure of myself and my people. Uh, but if this pandemic has shown us anything, it's that you and I are not in control, that there are forces outside of us that, that rob us of our autonomy and our self-determination um, that we pride ourselves on. Control is a myth. Uh, we can do everything right. We can work hard in our jobs. Uh, we, we can do everything that we can and yet still be met with disappointment and layoffs and restructuring. Uh, we can be faithful in our marriages and our spouse can choose to not honor their marriage vows. Uh, we can do everything we can to ensure our, that our kids behave, believe, uh, and be safe but still be left with broken relationships. And so don't get me wrong. These are good things, right? Uh, we want our kids to behave. We spend the first five years of our kid's life uh, helping them to learn, to behave, to fit in to society's expectations. Well-behaved kids uh, get good grades. Uh, they, they get friends. They uh, go on to graduate and go to a school or, or military or work, whatever it is that they want to do. Um, they keep their jobs because people like compliance. Uh, we want our kids to believe. Any parent that has experienced the forgiveness and freedom that comes from Jesus, and we want our kids to, to have that same experience. Uh, Third John says this, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Now, John's talking about uh, spiritual children, but how much more for our actual children to know that they're walking with Jesus? We want our kids to be safe, right? Uh, we, we buy the cabinet locks when their kids are little. Uh, we get the, the 
um, the car seat that has the best safety rating. Uh, we buy the Subaru because the commercials all but promise that our rookie driver won't become a statistic, right? We want desperately to keep our kids safe. And so these all come from a good place. They come from good intentions. Uh, as good parents, we exhort, we exert our power and our influence over our kids uh, to ensure that they're successful, that they behave, believe, and be safe. But we soon find out from our kids that no isn't just one of their first words, uh, it's a heart posture. We're reminded early and often that, that we are not in control. And so no matter uh, how many parenting books we read or podcasts we listen to or, or family Bible studies we go to, uh, we all, because we want these things, end up resorting to what Paul Tripp calls the power tools of parenting. And, and, and those tools are fear, reward, uh, and shame. And so depending on your child's personality, their demeanor, uh, fear and shame uh, can go a long, long way. They're, they're good tools, right? Like I'm not going to say uh, as a parent, we never use those things. Uh, but eventually the batteries run out on those tools because they're short-term tools, not parenting strategies. Uh, we can modify our kids' behavior in our presence, uh, but we can't make them behave all the time. You, you can't guilt a kid, uh, to, you, or sorry, you can guilt your kids into coming to church. You can make them get baptized. Uh, they can play church, but you can't make them believe. Um, we can helicopter all we want, but, but we can't keep our kids from sickness, uh, from relational pain, from the eventuality of failure. Uh, from the seeming randomness of accidents. As much as we want them to believe and behave uh, and be safe, control is an illusion. And, and so I'm not saying that we shouldn't challenge our kids. We shouldn't uh, discipline them or develop them. Go back to last week. Uh, but what I am saying is that we have to redefine the win. And, and to redefine the win is to move uh, from outward competency to, the, to their inward character. And so today we're going to look at the scriptures uh, at a passage called the fruit of the spirit. And, and if you grew up in Sunday school or VBS or went to camp, maybe you learned a song uh, about the fruit of the spirit. Uh, the fruit of the spirit, they're more than just personality traits. Uh, they're more than just like Jesus merit badges that we, that we add uh, to our collection. They're the evidence uh, that those of us who have said that we want to follow Jesus have actually made him Lord and Savior of our life, uh, that we've actually been made a new creation. And so we're going to look today in Galatians 5, uh, where Paul talks about this battle that happens in the heart of every person, uh, including your sweet and innocent child. And, and, and it's a war between good and evil. It's that conversation that happens in the cartoons where you have the angel in one ear and the demon in the other, and they're, they're holding this tension uh, between what we naturally want to do and what we intrinsically know uh, is wise and right. And so we're going to jump in at verse 16. It says, uh, so I say this, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Uh, other translations say, walk in the Spirit. Then you won't be doing uh, what your sinful nature or what the flesh craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, uh, which is the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us the desire to do the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. And these two forces constantly uh, fighting against each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. See, Paul invites us uh, to walk with God, to walk in the Spirit, to navigate life in the power and presence of the living God, uh, which sounds great until we realize that it's easier said than done because of this battle that's raging uh, within each of us. Because we want to, we all want to do what is right, but we also want to do what feels good and what feels right. Uh, and so uh, we, we talked about this reality that that um, Jesus removes us from the power of sin, but not the presence and the temptation of sin. And so the tension that we live our lives in is this tension, uh, the same tension that our kids are experiencing in their life, because they too have an inner person, a spirit, a soul, uh, the same as you and I. And we see this play out in our kids' lives. 
Uh, they really, they want to do good, but there's this heavy dose of foolishness that the Proverbs say, foolishness is born bound up in the heart of a child. Uh, it's just overflowing at, when they're young. And so uh, there's this war between good and evil, right and wrong. And so when you when you sit down with your kid, they, they want to do right, but you say, hey, why did you throw the ball in the house and break the chandelier? You know, why did you hit your sister or your brother? Uh, why, did, why did you steal the toy from your friend? Uh, why did you lie to us? And their answer is almost always the same. I don't know. Because, because they don't know. They, they're not able to process and articulate what's going on. You know, they're not, your, your eight-year-old's not going to sit down and go, well, you see, Dad, I have these two natures inside of me. And, and there's this war where I'm trying to do what's good, but I also want to do what I want to do. And next time, I'll try to listen to the Spirit and to do what, what He says, right? They're, they're not going to say that. Uh, their brains are developing, as Jen talked about. But the problem is this. Uh, Paul goes on to list uh, the eventuality of where these desires lead us. And some of them are much more adult than you have to worry about when they're in pre-K, but some of them will sound familiar. Uh, it, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, uh, dissension, division. That's the fruit of our flesh. That's the fruit of our natural desires. But then we have to teach them a different way. We have to equip them with the tools to fight against the natural tendency uh, towards pleasure, towards entertainment, towards self-centeredness. And, and here's what that the, those tools are. Verse 22 picks up, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And, and so these sound like fluffy unicorn feelings, right? Uh, but they're actually weapons of warfare. That, that uh, These are the internal components that our kids need to fight and to resist uh, and to succeed, not just in the natural world around us, but in the unseen, hidden world uh, of our mental, spiritual, and emotional uh, worlds. And, and if we don't value these things, if we don't cultivate this fruit of the Spirit in their life, uh, what will happen is our kids will grow up and they'll win the trophies and, and the scholarships and they will be launched into the world um, with the competence they need but lack the character that they need to have uh, to, be, to make us who we really are. And so a little overview of the, the fruit of the Spirit. Um, we could spend a lot of time on each one, right? Because each one of these is, is so important. We could take weeks and talk about love. Uh, Pastor Matt did a whole series on peace Right, And so I'm just going to run through each of these and, and revisit just one of them. Uh, but the fruit of the Spirit is singular. It's not the fruits of the Spirit. Paul doesn't talk about the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, he says that there's one interconnected fruit. And so what that means is we don't get to choose the ones that we like, that, that fit our personality and our preference, and not worry about the others. Um, when we submit to the Spirit... Uh, the, these aren't linear stairs or levels that we unlock or achieve, right? You don't get love and then joy and then peace and then patience, right? Uh, th these are things that God is doing in us. All of these things in some capacity should show up in our lives uh, for those of us who follow Jesus. And, and so uh, for, for those of us who, who say we follow Jesus, we can't be content to simply be faithful, to have the right doctrine, to be courageous in our faith, but lack gentleness and kindness. Or we can't have gentleness and kindness, but lack self-discipline uh, and excuse sin and laziness, right? Uh, lastly, we need to understand that this is the fruit of the Spirit, not the root of the Spirit. And, and so these things uh, uh, are the result of our faith in Jesus. They can't lead us to faith in Jesus. You can't love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, you know, self-control your way into heaven. You, you, that's not the way it works. These are the results, uh, not the, the foundation. And, and Jesus is our root and our tree. And then these are the fruit that come out of that. Uh, Jesus talks about this in John 15, where he says, I, Jesus, I'm the fruit of the, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will become even more fruitful. 
Remain in me as I remain in you. No, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So our first priority, our first place, is to make sure that our kids are grounded and rooted in Jesus. Um, we cannot make them believe, but we can cultivate a garden. We can create a culture in our house uh, where we value our faith, where we are desperately dependent uh, on Jesus. We can help them understand the gospel, uh, that the reason that they don't do the things that they want to do and the reason they do the things they don't want to do is because there's something broken in us that we need to be healed and restored and made new. Um, we, we can partner with the church like South Point uh, that prioritizes kids and students, that, that, that wants to match the love of the family with the love of the church. And so we don't get to... T- we don't get to determine when and if our kids click and make that decision. Um, but we need to be intentional about planting seeds of faith uh, that whatever that we do whatever we can do to help our kids discover who Jesus is and how following him makes all the difference. And then from that place of faith and salvation, then we begin to cultivate uh, the fruit of the Spirit in them. And this is tricky because it might feel like I'm being contradictory. Um, But again, just the way you can't force faith, um, you can't force fruit in your kid's life. Uh, We can't, we can teach these characteristics, um, but we can't make it happen. They're the spirit, uh, the fruit of the spirit. And so if you're frustrated, if you feel like, well, then what are we doing? I I can't do it. You're right. You can't do it. Um, We are unable. We can't change our kids. We can't make them behave, believe, or be safe. Uh, and, and we can't create fruit in their life. We have to lay down control. Let's walk quickly through these fruit of the Spirit. Uh, first comes love, right? Love is always first in the Bible. Uh, the, the faith, hope, and love remain, but the greatest of these is love, right? Who is God? God is love. Uh, what's the greatest commandment? To love God and love others, right? We love because he first loved us. Then, then comes joy. Joy is more than happiness. Uh, it, it is transcendent. It is above whatever's going on in a current circumstance. It is believing that God is good and that life is worth living on good days and bad days. I, I bet there's someone in your life that you can think of that exhibits this fruit of the Spirit. Uh, next comes peace. Peace is more than just being a pushover or a doormat. Peace is really about restoring things to the way that they were, the way that they are meant to be. And so think about a peacemaker in your life. Uh, Patience. Patience is waiting for what we want, even when it's hard. And uh, some of us didn't grow up with three sisters in one bathroom where you had to wait a lot. Some of us didn't have to wait for the cookie at the end of the day. Um, And and it shows, right? We're not good at waiting. Kindness comes next. Uh, Kindness is more than being nice, right? Kindness is about humbling ourselves, about uh, making what, what is, uh, what is uh, necessary and good for others more important. And so uh, that's kindness. Goodness comes next. We're going to develop this in just a moment. Uh, but goodness is about excellence in character. Then comes faithfulness. Faithfulness is courageous commitment to the truth, right? And then gentleness. Uh, I think the best illustration I can think of for gentleness is my friend Jen. She's a volunteer here in the office. Uh, and uh, she's got this big dog. You remember Spuds McKenzie from the 90s Bud Light commercials? Right? He's a bull terrier, like a tough looking dog. Uh, and, and she also has a little girl, uh, like an actual tiny human, right? And uh, on social media, you'll see uh, Gracie's just laying on, on the dog, slapping him and pulling on his ears and, and playing rough. And he never responds. Um, he, 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 when she was younger, could probably just eat her whole, right? But he understood his strength and that she wasn't an actual threat. And that is what gentleness is. It is constrained power. Uh, and in a world where we're taught to win at all costs, to crush anyone who gets in our way, uh, gentleness is a fruit of the spirit that is uncommon. And then lastly, self-control. I don't need to spend a lot of time here because I think we'd all agree that, that most kids are born deficient in this area. 
And um, the fruit of the Spirit don't necessarily have ranks or values, but I mean, I think if there's one area that can cause significant damage in our life, it's self-control. But what I want to focus on today uh, is goodness, because I think really this is the summation of what we want for and from our kids. Um, We want them to be good, right? And, And so we drop them off at grandma's house or their friend's house, and we say, be good, right? We go into a nice store and we say, well, first, don't touch anything. And secondly, be good, right? Uh, when our kids were younger, my wife and I, we'd pride ourselves that we'd go out to a restaurant and inevitably some older couple would come over and they would say, wow, your kids are so well behaved. They're so good. We go like, I know, right? It's because we're awesome parents. No, that's not what we would say, right? But we would pride ourselves that they were well behaved, that they were good. Uh, but there has to be more than good because we've all watched Datelines or 2020s or crime podcasts where people that would be described as good do terrible things. And so there has to be more than good for goodness sake. Uh, Goodness is a spiritual fruit. We value goodness as an external quality, um, but really, as I said, the Greek actually means uh, excellence of character, an internal attribute. Real quick, then, I'll take us to Mark 10. Uh, Jesus is, is, uh, says he's on his way, and a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asks a strange question. He says, Why do you call me good? Only God is good. See, goodness is about having the highest moral standard, uh, the highest spiritual standard. It's not behavior modification. It's rooted in knowing what is true and good and right and then doing it. And only God does that perfectly. Only Jesus demonstrated that perfectly for us. And so Jesus says, why do you say good? Only God is good. Uh, but then he answers this question. He says, hey, you, you, you know the commandments. Don't kill, uh, don't steal, uh, don't, don't lie, don't defraud, honor your mom and dad. And, and he responds, the, the young man, I, I've done all these things since I was young. Right? In other words, check, check, check. I'm good, right? Uh, but Jesus looked at him, and I think this is critical. He says he looked at him, and he loved him. And he said this, one thing you lack, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. And the man's face fell, and he went away sad uh, because it says that he had great wealth. There's a lot we can say about this passage, and, and usually it's taught uh, in the context of generosity, that, uh, that our wealth, our possessions, our stuff, our things, uh, they're not just for ourselves, that we're blessed to be a blessing to others. And I think that's true, but I think today our focus is really on this idea of goodness. It says the, the, the young ruler, he wanted to be good, good with God, good with people around him. But Jesus discerned from this young man Uh, that his definition of good was about the outside. It was about how things looked. But on the inside, Jesus, because he loved him and he was willing to be honest, was able to say that that this young man's stuff was owning him. And and that in order for him to be truly good with God and with others, he needed to sell his stuff and, and come and follow Jesus. That he needed to put God first and his stuff second. Now, when we bring this back to our kids, when we bring this back home and translate it, uh, what, it what it means is that uh, what we need for them is not just to, to be good and to look good and to be well-behaved. Uh, th- this young man was good by all the standards, right? He walked, Jesus walked him through some of the expectations and he said, yep, I, I've done all of those things. I'm good. Uh, but we need more than that. We need, we need more for them to look good, uh, to focus less on what they do and more on what they're becoming. And we have to ask this question. Are they excellent in character or are they playing excellent characters? Are they just acting like they have it together? See, when this happens, uh, they'll have all the competence that they need to launch into the world, but they will lack the character to handle it. And so as we wrap up, I'm gonna land the plane a little hard because I've gone a little long today. Uh, But I want to leave us with with three kind of uh, miracle grows that will help till the soil and to grow uh, the garden and the soil of our kids. And and the three Ps are this. The first is prayer. Uh, That if control is a myth, 
if there's only so much that we can do for our kids, uh, at some point we have to release them to God and into a broken and busted world. And uh, prayer might sound like a superficial churchy answer, but prayer is like uh, rain in the garden of our child's soul. That some of us are only here today because of the faithfulness of God uh, and because we had a praying relative or somebody that was praying for us. And, and so um, prayer allows us to say, God, we really do trust you. And it releases us from the grip of the not enough monster that wants to guilt and shame us for every bump in the road. It allows us to work like we are and parent like it's up to us and to pray like it really is up to God. Uh, it allows us to say, not my will, but yours be done, God, on earth as it is in heaven. Second is second P is proximity. Uh, I think it's possible uh, for a single fruit tree to grow on its own. Uh, but man, fruit trees grow better in an orchard. They grow faster and healthier when they're alongside other fruit trees. Uh, and so I wanna encourage you, stay connected with a local church uh, like South Point. Uh, stay connected somewhere uh, that is invested in your kids and in their success. And so I wanna make a confession. We've never done this before. We've never led through a pandemic. And so a lot of our kids and student environments are based on the assumption that, that we're gonna spend an hour together and then like a big meal at a restaurant, we're gonna pack up some to go and hand it to you um, to, to continue that throughout the week. Well, now congratulations, you're a home chef um, and we are now trying to catch up and to, to better equip and partner with you um, to be the spiritual leader in your house in this season. And so um, on our church website, we have uh, put up a page at southpointforyou.com slash parents, uh, where our kids and student team ha have curated and created content where every week there's lessons that um, you know, from Mr. Joe and Ms. Bree and, and, and the student team about uh, that, that you can watch at home and unpack together. Uh, there's tools and resources there like how can you pray for your child? And so I wanna encourage you to go check out southpointforyou.com slash parents. And lastly, uh, the last P is patience. See, parenting is a long journey. Uh, there are good days and bad days, and, and it feels like sometimes there are more bad days than not. Uh, so give yourself and your kids some extra patience and grace in this season. So just like physical growth, uh, spiritual growth happens in spurts. And, and so sometimes it might feel like there are seasons where they're stuck, um, where they're not growing. And then there'll be other seasons where it feels like you can see it happening right in front of your eyes. And so think about when you pull pictures out of an old shoebox or Facebook uh, memories or time hop, whatever, you know, and just a year or two later, you can see such dramatic change in your kids that you don't necessarily see in the everyday. Uh, so be patient. As we think about our kids and their spiritual growth, I want us to remember the power of the acorn. Uh, you see, uh, have you ever been uh, in a park or somewhere, maybe maybe your driveway or, or on a street, and, and a tree has busted up right next to or right through the concrete? That something so small as an acorn uh, has the power to, over time, uh, gather so much strength, so much perseverance, that it can push through and ultimately uh, go right through concrete. And I want us to remember this. Never underestimate the power of slow growth over time. When we focus on developing character, uh, it allows God to transform us from the inside out. And when that happens, God can move mountains. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much um, that there, there are parents uh, that genuinely want good for their kids. And, and sometimes we focus uh, on the outward, but God, today you invite us um, to, to the inside, that you are a God who knows the heart, who knows the intentions, um, and really who knows the end story of, of where you're leading us. And so God, I just pray for every parent uh, that, again, is, is often characterized by guilt and shame and not enough of all the things that we do wrong. And yet, God, we believe as we submit uh, to your way and your authority that you're able to do uh, what we can't do, that the Spirit of God is able to develop fruit in our kids' lives um, that we can't pass down to them, um, that it takes supernatural transformation uh, to, to go out into the world and to be love and to be peace. 
uh, and to be joy. And so, God, we pray uh, for every family that's represented. And God, I pray uh, for those who, who don't have kids in the house right now, uh, that you would work in us personally um, to, to develop the fruit of the Spirit in us, uh, that, that some of us uh, may be new in the faith, and so um, we, we're frustrated that we don't see all this fruit in our lives. But God, I pray that as, again, we submit to you, uh, that, that you would do a transforming work in us personally. God, we love you, we honor you, and it's in your name we pray, amen.